One of the very first things that I did after becoming president of ASH was to invite Dr. Freeman Herbowski III to be a keynote speaker at our 2020 conference. With the theme of advancing full participation, and at this particular moment in history, he was the person to ask, and I was so grateful that he said yes. Dr. Freeman Herbowski, president of UMBC since 1992, practically invented the concept of advancing full participation. A child leader in the civil rights movement, Dr. Herbowski was prominently featured in Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls, on the racially motivated bombing in 1963 of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. Born in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Herbowski graduated from Hampton Institute with the highest honors in mathematics and received his master's in mathematics and PhD in higher education administration and statistics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. UMBC has been recognized many times over as a national leader in academic innovation and undergraduate teaching. With philanthropist Robert Meyerhoff, Dr. Herbowski co-founded the Meyerhoff Scholars Program in 1988, which has been recognized by many for advancement of high achieving black and brown students in science and engineering. Dr. Herbowski's 2015 book, Holding Fast to Dreams, Empowering Youth from the Civil Rights Crusade to STEM Achievement, describes the events and experiences that played a central role in his development as an educator and leader. Recognized as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by time, and one of America's best leaders by US News and World Report, Dr. Herbowski received Tia Kreft's Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence, the Carnegie Foundation's Academic Leadership Award, the American Council on Education's Lifetime Achievement Award, and the University of California Berkeley's Clark Kerr Award, among many others. Dr. Herbowski holds honorary degrees from more than 40 institutions and is a thought leader and consultant on science and math education. He was named by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans and chaired the National Academy's Committee Report on Broadening Participation and Expanding Talent in STEM. Today, we are most excited to celebrate Dr. Herbowski's most recent book that he wrote with colleagues, Philip Rouse and Peter Henderson, The Empowered University, Shared Leadership, Culture Change, and Academic Success. To purchase a signed copy of Dr. Herbowski's book, The Empowered University, you can visit the exhibitor gallery in the menu bar of the conference website, navigate to the UMBC bookstore, and follow the links to make your purchase. The UMBC bookstore will work with Dr. Herbowski to get your copy signed and mailed to you. Written in Dr. Herbowski's voice, the first line of the book is, it's not about me, it's about us. The book goes on to describe the true grit values and unapologetically aspirational culture that he and colleagues have created together at UMBC. The accomplishments I have described are outstanding, but they perhaps do not fully capture the personal side of Dr. Herbowski. By this I mean that when you're around him, you feel his genuine warmth and interest in you, the energy he brings to his work and life. One of the last times I heard Dr. Herbowski speak in person was right before March Madness 2018. As many of you know, this was the first time a 16th seed had beaten a first seed in the first round of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. The pictures of Dr. Herbowski embracing students in celebration of that win say much about their close relationship. But so does what came next. In an op-ed shortly after, Dr. Herbowski observed that this win was only part of UMBC's story of hard work. That story included two of the strongest players earning 4.0 GPAs that past fall and UMBC educating more black students who go on to earn an MD PhD than any other institution in the nation. And more black students go on to earn a PhD in the natural sciences and engineering than any institution not classified as an HBCU. He reminded those excited by the basketball win that UMBC had been national champions in chess and cyber defense before then and more than once. I connected with a colleague who works closely with Dr. Hebrowski at UMBC and he said, Freeman leads from authenticity and his lifetime of personal experience. He has taught countless others, colleagues and students alike to do the same, to know and own our stories and bring them to bear 
on our opportunities to make a difference. I asked UMBC alum Dr. Damani White-Lewis if he could ask fellow UMBC graduates about Dr. Hrabowski. UMBC graduates use the words dynamic, principled, authentic, compassionate, and creative. They observed how well and how often he listens and said that he's always learning. One alum said, a gracious yet tenacious man with deep wisdom, a leader whose eye looks at what America will be and creates a unified vision to reflect that future world. In fact, my desire to have Dr. Hrabowski here with us today had another agenda. I asked him here to speak with us, not knowing what the outcome of the 2020 election would be. I wanted us to have someone with us at this critical point in time who could provide hope and resilience from experience and by example, and help us recommit to advancing full participation, regardless of the outcome of the election. Dr. Friedman Herbowski is that person. We thank the University of Maryland College Park, which is sponsoring this session. My University of Maryland colleague, Dr. Damani Lewis, an alum of UMBC, will interview Dr. Herbowski after he has completed his talk. It is now my greatest honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Freeman Herbowski III as a 2020 ASH speaker. Hello, I'm Freeman Herbowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC. Before the presentation, I want to make this land acknowledgement on behalf of my campus. UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respect to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. I am delighted today to be speaking for ASHE. I have great respect for the organization. Let me start by congratulating my, my colleague, Carrie Ann O'Meara, for her commitment to these issues of diversity and inclusion and participation in higher education. Congratulations, Carrie Ann, as the president of ASHE. I begin with words from a great American, Eleanor Roosevelt, who said that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And my message always is that our dreams and our values shape who we are not only today, but in the future. Whether talking about us as individuals or talking about our universities or talking about our society. Uh, we are in a very special period in the evolution of humankind, in the development of our country. This past period of COVID and political divisions and social unrest, has been a period that is telling us so much about our values. The past election has said so much about who we are as Americans, uh, but also as people around the world. We get to see what people believe. Uh, we get a sense of what's important to them. And we see also how divided we are around the world, how divided we are in this country. And so I want to begin with something that doesn't divide us, but that shows what we have in common as human beings. Every person has a story. And much of who we are, when we think about our lives, our values, our actions, much of that comes from things that happened to us as children. Whether, whether we were born in New York or Birmingham or in Nigeria um, or in Russia, Wherever we are, our childhood experiences make such a difference. I'm sitting in the back of church in the middle of the week. I'm 12 years old. I don't want to be there. My parents insist that I come and hear this man talk, this minister. And I'm being placated by my parents with the two things I love most, food and mathematics. And so I'm eating M&Ms, the good kind, with the peanuts. You know the kind. And I'm doing my little algebra and solving a word problem. And I'm listening to him talk about poverty and racism. And at some point, he says this. If the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand the difference 
that we make as we think about what we do to help our children. And they will see that our children know the difference between right and wrong. And our children will be able to go to better schools. Now, we always believed in our teachers, our black teachers who worked so hard to help us, but we knew we didn't have the resources. And I was always bothered that they would, that the school system would give the black children, the black schools, books that had been used by whites for years were torn up and had brown paper bag around them to keep them together. And, and we were not even allowed sometimes to bring in our own books that our parents could buy, even in some cases, just because we weren't supposed to be different. And so I wanted to see what these other schools had, these white schools had that was so special besides the supplies. And so I looked up and I said, who is this guy? And they said his name was Dr. Martin Luther King. I went home, told my parents I had to go. I just, I was determined to go. And of course they said, no, you're too young because if you go, you're going to jail. The next morning they come in and they tell me I can go. Um, I had told them they were hypocrites. They had sent me to my room. I thought they were going to punish me, but instead they said, we will put you in God's hands. I did go. It was a horrific experience. We were treated like animals. We were there for five days of children. And I was with the children between about eight and up to 14. Um, I was a little more advanced. And so even though I was 12, I was actually about to go to the 10th grade. So I was more mature with older parents and had a chance to help and support a lot of kids. But in the middle of the week, Dr. King came and said this to us. Um, we're looking out the windows with our parents. Little kids are crying, wanting to get out. And he said, what you do this day as children will have an impact on children who've not yet been born. We, we, didn't, we didn't fully understand it, but we sensed somehow the profundity that there was meaning there. And shortly after that, we saw the march on Washington. We saw the awful bombing of the church with our little friends and the four little girls. We saw uh, the march in, on Selma. And before we knew it, the world was changed and just fundamentally changed for America and other parts of the world. Uh, and you see that through the legislation. Now, I tell you that story because it relates to what I say to my students when they say to me, Doc, it's never been this bad before. We've got the social protests. We've got these divisions. We can't get things done in Congress. And uh, we have concerns about the federal level in so many ways. The values don't seem to be what you've taught us, what we've been taught all of our lives. And, and my point to them is you can go back to the 60s and see a parallel. Well, they're talking about the 60s in the 1900s or the 1800s and the divided country. And the key is that after that social protest period, uh, what we saw after the terrible assassination of President Kennedy, what we saw was legislation um, led by a Southerner, Lyndon Johnson, master of the Senate. And we had the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Higher Education Act and many others, but those in that 1964, 1965 period. And what do I mean when I say we were changed in so many ways? Well, usually if I'm with you in, in person, I would ask you to raise your hands if you know what percent of people had graduated from college in the mid 60s. Some of you, many of you are experts, so you would know, but most Americans don't know that it was only 10%. And when you break it down at that time, things were broken down in black and white. Um, just as television was black and white at that time. The fact is that um, you had only three to four percent of blacks, perhaps 11 percent of whites. Today, we have moved to another point. But remember that 90 percent of Americans in the 60s had not expected their kids to go to college. In fact, the only ones that typically would be going would be people from privilege, who had been from educated families. I often ask people the question in the 40s, how many have heard of the GI Bill? Not because you were here, but, but you read about it, and most have, and FDR. And, and I asked, do you know who fought the GI Bill? When we think about this notion of full participation, um, it was college presidents, from the president of the University of Chicago to the president of Harvard. Fine people, well-educated products of their childhood experiences. They thought people of privilege were to go to liberal arts colleges, to, to our universities. They thought that people, veterans even, should be going into trades. And they actually said, if you allow these veterans into our institutions, our institutions will become, quote, academic hobo jungles. Now, that's where we were in the 40s. And yet, a couple of million people came in. 
veterans, primarily white guys, some women, a few blacks, but mainly white guys. Uh, but remember that I'm saying that even regular white guys were not welcomed at first into college. Uh, but they came and they did well and people began to change attitudes. So by the 1965 Higher Education Act, people knew regular people could perhaps go to college. And we saw the evolution of the middle class. And people began to think after that in the late 60s, as we went on and we got Pell Grant in the early 70s, and we began to look at ways in which people could pay for or get loans and other kinds of funds to pay for their education. Americans began to want their children to go to college more and more. Um, Interestingly enough, the majority of blacks who went to college at that period, for the vast majority in the before the 70s were at HBCUs. And while it may have changed today and 75, 80 percent of blacks and other kinds of institutions, uh, the, 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 the story of the black higher education rests on those institutions. And, and we're proud of those like my beloved Hampton and, and others. But here is the point. Today, we've moved from. Only 10% with a college degree to about 30%, as you know. And when you break it down, we still see it's high 30% for whites. It's um, early 20%, 23 24% for blacks, uh, for Asians, uh, people of Asian background from some particularly, but generally it's over 50% because many actually uh, people of Asian backgrounds came here to grad school and then their kids are here, but there's still some Asian populations that have not been advantaged like that. And then for the largest, the, the fastest growing minority group in our country, Latinos, the Latinx population, it's still only about 15%. You put it together and what I'm saying is fully two thirds of Americans still have not had someone in their families go to college and graduate. And that's the other point. The book that my colleagues and I wrote in the past year that we're using around the country um, is entitled The Empowered University. And the subtitle is Shared Leadership, Culture Change and Academic Success. And the message empowered to do what? Whether as a university or as a society, as humankind, empowered to look in the mirror and to be honest with self as we think about advancing full participation. There are many things I could say, but the few that are most important today would be these. Number one, that we know too many students of different backgrounds come to college and never graduate. We know that too many students come to college without the academic preparation they need that we need to look at what we're doing in the pre-K through 12 space as we think about the role of higher education, that we need to understand more about the important role of community colleges who are now uh, literally bringing in 40 some percent of all students in higher education, moving towards half, quite frankly, that we need to look at um, what this means for the our population as we think about what happens to educated people in the citizenry, what role do they play? All of us are concerned at this point about the need for um, an emphasis on seeking the truth, that we've been through a period when the truth and evidence have been um, devalued by the highest levels in our society, right, where we have not been driven by, governed by, informed by the best practices of evidence and science, this COVID vaccine problem. The fact that we are now with educated people who are working to have a plan for our country and as we work with other countries to understand the important role that higher education plays in connecting to others around the world, that scientists and humanists and artists around the world work with each other, understanding that some things go beyond geographical boundaries. If, if nothing says that, this COVID situation does, but so does social unrest, because the challenges we are facing here as we think about structural racism are issues around the world, just as the issues involving women uh, and issues involving LGBTQ in different ways in which human beings are different, that we see in different societies, people not being fair and equitable. And so I want us to think about what we need to do as we are empowered to look in the mirror at self 
and to understand what else we need to do. We all involved in remote learning, teaching and learning. We have been for some time. And I hear people all the time saying, oh, we'll be glad when we get back to normal or we get back to where we're all in person because we do such a much, a much better job. Well, the first thing I would say is that what I've seen on our campus is that faculty are working really hard, and I'm sure on yours, to do all we can to use the technology to make sure students are grasping concepts, that they feel some sense of connection, that we build community. And one of the things I say that often shocks people is we want to get back to the way things were. But when I look at STEM, if you look at my TED talk, you'll see my saying, we were not doing uh, anything like as good a job as we need to do. That that we still call the first year of, of STEM, perhaps the first two years, we don't courses. You'll hear the NSF talking about trying to work on ways to change the culture. And so a part of what I'm saying is that we must look at our culture as a society, but also as universities. It was Eric Weiner, Eric Weiner, uh, in his book, The Geography of Bliss, who said, culture is the sea we swim in. So all consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out and look back at it. And I'm challenging us to step out and look back at ourselves, whether talking about the teaching and learning process, because professors do an amazing job in many cases, but we know we have challenges, that we have so many students that the majority of students who come, two thirds of students of all races who come to college with an interest in STEM will change their majors within the first year or two. Uh, and the fact is that if you look at it by race, yes, it's true that 80% of Blacks and Latinx students leave science, but literally um, uh, almost 70% of whites leave. It's the high 60s uh, percent will leave science. And for Asians, it's still 60% leave. Now, why is that important? Well, people at first want to, people always want to say it's a K through 12 problem. Because you see, colleges blame high schools and high schools blame, blame elementary schools. Elementary schools blame the families and the husband blames the wife's side of the family. We all blame somebody. We point the fingers. Uh, the commission that I chaired for the National Academy of Sciences looked at this issue and we had people from Harvard and MIT to Howard to Miami-Dade Community College to somebody from the U Texas system, a variety of institutions. And what we saw was, and quite frankly, Often, the more prestigious the institution and the better prepared the student is based on the student's test scores and grades, the more likely the student will leave science. But you think about that, uh, that often it's not about K-12. It's Although we know we need to improve substantially the K-12 background, what I'm telling you is that many of the students who have an interest in STEM and who are well prepared by all the measures we use still don't succeed. And it's not, we thought, well, maybe it's because they want to go into a discipline where you can make more money. No, it's often because they get a grade below a B. And anybody who's a valedictorian or who's used to A's is not going to deal with that. What we've done at UMBC that's a part of our approach, several things that I want to mention that I'm looking forward to talking with you about in the question and answers. One is to build our Mauhoff program, which is designed to increase the number of underrepresented groups, starting with African-Americans and others who uh, will succeed in science. And we're defining success not simply as graduating, that's one level, but of doing so well. Well, have done research in undergrad school with reasonable grades, A's and B's, that, they, that these students want to go on to grad school, to MD, PhDs and PhDs. And so while we had a major problem 30 years ago in producing blacks in science, we actually, when we looked at the data using analytics, another tool we need to talk about, uh, found that students in general were not succeeding. And we tend in STEM to say that when most students don't make it, it's because the quality is so is so high. And yet what we've come to understand at UNBC is quality should be defined not just by the rigor of the work, the high standards in what we expect from students, but also the, the level of support we give students. What's the quality of the academic and moral support we give students? Uh, that at approach of analytics, of building a program that focuses on a cadre of students, a cohort, the cohort model, that program has led to our being the leading producer of blacks 
who earn bachelor's degrees from us and go on and complete MD, PhDs in the country, in the history of America. And we're at the top with, along with Howard University, as an institution producing blacks who go on to get STEM PhDs. And we are not an HBCU. We have students from 100 countries. We're probably half minority, uh, half white. Uh, with um, the largest minority actually being Asian. We're about 20% African-Americans. And this is at a campus that's a public research campus where, interestingly enough, a part of our education, 60% of our freshmen have a parent from another country. Uh, and yet these are American students, a part of the American demographic. But I tell you all that to say we've learned a great deal from working with minority students, with Black students and others, uh, in thinking about what it takes to succeed. And my TED Talk, refers to just that. The four pillars of college success are actually four pillars that can be used in success in, in college in general, but I would say in life, high expectations, building community, understanding it takes, we say scientists to produce scientists, but I would say it takes humanists to produce humanists. We take scholars in higher education to produce other scholars in higher education. And then whatever we're doing should be evaluated so we can decide how we change what we're doing. And we've used that model now, not just in STEM, but in the humanities, um, uh, in a humanities program, in a Linehan Artist Scholars program, in a Sunheim Public Affairs program. And we built these models of community uh, in which students support each other, in which faculty are even more involved with the students and programs that inspire students to want to go to the next level. But the success at that level has led us to think very carefully about how to increase um, the, the numbers of students succeeding in general, not just with those who are among the best, but for the regular student. The question is, what do we do to help many more of them, many more actually succeed? And so I would argue that we should be thinking about course redesign, which is a part of what you'll see in the work we do. We should be thinking about the use of analytics to understand the, the trends. We should also be thinking in many ways about the use of focus groups to listen carefully to students and all the issues that we're dealing with on equity and inclusion, whether it's about issues involving Title IX, issues involving structural racism, we have to be have the honest, difficult conversations. I said in a talk, to the American Council on Education when I received their Lifetime Achievement Award a couple of years ago, that one of our challenges is that we talk about desegregating higher education. And so we do have people of color in most institutions, but we've not really talked about what integration means. And so while we want to respect the right of different groups to spend time together, of course we do. Uh, whether it's women or Blacks, Asians, Latinx, it's wonderful to know one's own. But the question is, what are we doing to help students and faculty understand each other's perspectives. Uh, it's, it's important, it seems to me, right now, as we think about how divided our country is, that we spend time, as we think about full participation, looking at all races, all groups, but first-generation college students, and looking at what has happened in the thinking of people who've never been exposed to higher education, who don't understand what we bring to the table that we have a role and a responsibility to those students. And, and I wanna say something that's controversial. And it is this, that, that the liberal arts college education does not have to be the first approach we take for every student. This may sound like sacrilege, but there are students who simply don't want that immediately. And so post-secondary opportunities, I think we should be thinking about uh, with the understanding that many may go a different direction at first and, and then come when they can really appreciate the higher education experience that we talk about even more. I see, I see that with veterans who will tell me, Doc, I would not have appreciated the significance of this history course before I'd had other experiences. So I think we need to open our minds to different ways of exposing students to the work we have, because we know that for those who want by far to be leaders in our society, but also to be strong citizens, that the, the liberal arts approach is can be very helpful to people, even uh, at both the two-year and the four-year level, even as they get skills that they need. And I would also say in the spirit of the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or, I wish I had said that that's from Jim Collins, that we shouldn't be thinking about STEM or humanities and social sciences. We have to think about ways of connecting, of interdisciplinarity. As I think about um, what we're doing in our society to prepare people for different jobs, but also to be citizens and also to be able to think critically and to appreciate the difference between opinion and fact. 
And so I want you finally to think about what we will be doing with our curricula around the country as we and our professional development, not just in thinking about use of technology, but how do we take this experiment right now that has us as a country and as a society so divided as we think about democracy and what it means? How do we prepare future teachers and social workers and physicians and lawyers and artists and, and politicians to understand structural racism and discrimination of all types and to be able to have conversations that encourage people to listen carefully. Our Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement focuses on ways of bringing people from different perspectives together. We, we often say we have to learn to agree to disagree agreeably with civility and to hear the other perspective. You know, as I think about empowering our institutions to prepare leaders for the future, I often think about the role we as educators must play to have that passion that says to people, we are vital to this society. Just as we think about how we should be reimagining the curriculum and, and considering ways of making sure our students are prepared for this divided society, we should be thinking about structures on our campus that can support students from different backgrounds. If you get a chance, look at um, a, an article that my colleagues and I wrote on theory of change, a social transformation theory of change and about minority participation in ways of empowering students to be involved in the development of programs that can support them. Perhaps the most impressive approach we've used in the past couple of years has to do with our equity and inclusion Council and that office that reports to the president's office through our chief of staff. And the point is that 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 council consists of some of our most prestigious colleagues and students from student leaders to staff to faculty. And that's the point I want to make. This cannot be, when we think about issues of structural racism, it cannot be simply about some wonderful people of color focusing on these issues. The question is, how do we have people of all races? Uh, and people in um, the most prestigious of positions on our campus. And so for us, we have wonderful faculty colleagues involved in this council, in addition to staff and student leaders. But we also have the chair, the council being chaired by the office, head of the Office of Equity and Inclusion and by the Dean of Engineering, um, who also brings the perspective of LGBTQ, who understands diversity. And so the idea of a, of a Dean of Engineering and uh, a multicultural person uh, uh, from a legal background coupled with all these faculty will mean that we are getting this sense of responsibility into the hands of all of the people of the campus. It's critical that the professoriate be an important part of the solution. And so I leave you with words from a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's, a very good friend. And again, one of the people most admired in American society. Her name, Mary McLeod Bethune. She was the head of that institute in Florida uh, for women of color, Literary Institute for Women of Color. Um, and here is the story. She had invited a very wealthy philanthropist, a uh, white guy, to come and become a member of her board. And she was very poor there at the school. They were getting cracked dishes from hotels and discarded linen. Uh, and she's sitting there uh, in the yard of the school peeling potatoes. And the guy comes up and he sees this rundown facility. And he looks at her and says, where is this school that you want me to be a trustee of? And she stands and looks at him looks him in his eyes, and she said, in my mind, in my soul, I see that. I see that woman, that African-American woman, fighting for the education of her girls. And I think to myself, how dare we not fight for every child the same way? 
Thank you very much.